الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So today insha'Allah we're going to be speaking about Al-Imam Malik bin Anas rahimahullah And to be completely honest I didn't know much about Imam Malik Other than what is commonly known That he is the founder of the Maliki Madhab And that his Madhab spread predominantly in um, Africa, particularly Western Africa, and that he taught Imam Shafi'i and so on. So I went, while I was doing research, I was actually amazed um, at the of what little I read, because I'm sure there is much more that was written or has been written about Imam Malik. And this is, subhanAllah, something that the more you look into the histories and the biographies and the stories of the pious predecessors, the more inspiring they are and the more beautiful they are and the more motivating they are for us to do something that is at the very least something similar. Something similar. And as the poet says in Arabic, um, So, um, try to be similar to those, who are, to those who are good and pious if you're not like them. At least, if you're similar to those people, then you would have somewhat succeeded. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah, um, will begin, uh, we'll begin with his birth. So he was actually born the same year that the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. So Anas bin Malik, the servant of the Prophet, the companion, passed away the same year that Imam Malik bin Anas was born. And this is a common misconception that they, um, Imam Malik is the son of, Imam, uh, of Anas. This is not the case. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Imam Malik is from a completely different lineage altogether. They just happen to share similar names. So um, uh, the lineage of Imam Malik is as follows. Malik bin Anas bin Malik bin Abi Amir and it continues on. But I want to stop here for a reason which is to look at the lineage of his three generations before and to see um, the similarity. So Imam Malik, his father was Anas. Anas was a Rawi as well. So he would actually narrate hadith to the point where Imam Al Zuhri, one of the major scholars of Medina, narrated from Anas. Right? And he was also a frequent mujahid, someone who would go out, he would do ghazu of the foreign lands, the non Muslim lands, and then he would come back. So that's his father. His grandfather was Malik. Right, so similar name. His grandfather was Malik. Malik was a tabi'i. So he met some of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, his rank was so high amongst the tabi'in that he, would, he was one of the scribes of Uthman Radiallahu Anhu of the Mus'haf. So he would write down the Mus'haf for Uthman Radiallahu Anhu. And he actually was one of the four people who washed and buried Uthman radiallahu anhu when he was killed. So that's the grandfather of Imam Malik. Now the father of his grandfather is Abi Amir, right? Or Abu Amir. He was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he witnessed all the battles with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except for the battle of Badr. So now if you look at that lineage, it's no surprise that someone like Imam Malik is going to be next in line. Someone who's going to have such knowledge that people would travel from all across the world to come and see Imam Malik and learn from him. Rahimahullah. And his mother, her name was Alia bin Tusharik. Um, and I didn't actually find too much on her except for the story which we're going to mention later on. And he died at the age of 89. So he lived for 89 years, uh, Rahimahullah. Now, his family, we're going to talk a bit about his family. He had an older brother. Okay, an older brother. Their father once asked the two of them a question in fiqh, in ilm. His older brother answered correctly and Imam Malik got it wrong when he was younger. So his father said, this is what you playing or this is what you're playing with the pigeons has caused. So because you're distracted, you, because you're going around playing with the hammam, with the pigeons, this is what you, where you end up. Number two. 
Imam Malik radiallahu anhu did not like this, or rahimahullah did not like this. So this was actually one of the stories or one of the pivotal moments in his life that motivated him to go and push and study and get educated in the Islamic sciences. The fact that he was put into second place because he was distracted by something else, something that is obviously inferior. He himself, rahimahullah, had a number of sons and a daughter. He may have had other daughters, but again, I'm just talking about what I found. This daughter of his was someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with the opportunity to be in the company of a scholar like her father. And so she learned from him. In fact, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he wrote a, a book of hadith named Al-Muwatta, right? Muwatta al-Imam Malik. So Imam Malik would sit in his house and he would have a majlis just for seeking knowledge. So he would sit, his students would come, they would all sit down and listen. And from, a, among, from amongst the attendees was someone who would read, read to Imam Malik. So the tradition was the student reads, the alim sits and listens. And as the book is being read, the hadith are being read, the imam or the scholar interrupts, explains, and gives biographies and uh, other accompanying verses or accompanying a hadith or supporting evidence. His daughter would sit behind the door. So imagine this was the majlis and that room over there is enclosed, right? She would sit behind the door and she would be listening. And sometimes the person reading would make a mistake that her father, Imam Malik, would not realize. So she would knock on the door to notify her father. And so her father would realize there's a mistake. Go back and we'll fix it and they move on. And this shows you, subhanAllah, someone who was dedicated to learning she found the ways, right? Of course, she had the opportunity to be in his household, but she found the way. She made it happen. She didn't stop and say, well, you know, these um, halaqat, these majalis of ilm, they're specifically for men, and I can't find a woman's one, so I'm just going to sit. No, rather, she took the means accessible to her. In contrast, her brother, so Imam Malik's son, one of them, his name was Muhammad. He was known to play with pigeons as well, right? And he would not sit in his father's halaqat. And, and he would just pass by. So one day Imam Malik saw him passing by. So he looked at him and he told his students, the adab is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gave it to my, uh, this is my daughter and this is my son. As in to say like, they came from the same household, but in the end it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, bestowal of that gift that he gives to whomever he wills. They both grew, in, grew up in, the similar environment, in a similar environment. And in fact, it could be argued that her brother had more opportunities. But she worked hard and memorized the muwatta, memorized the entire book, whereas her brother did not even attend the sessions in the first place, subhanAllah. So uh, now that we've done a bit about his family, I we want to speak about him seeking knowledge and his majlis of ilm. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah, started seeking knowledge when he was a teenager, in his teens. And he was so studious and uh, one so gifted, one of gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed upon him, that he was ready to give fatwa at the age of 21. So at the age of 21, he was now ready to give fatwa. But Imam Malik says that I didn't go and start giving fatwa until I was giving, given permission by those who were superior to me, as in those who are my teachers, those who were scholars present. And in some narrations it goes as far as saying that he got 70 approvals before he started teaching, before he started giving fatwa, sorry. And this is just to show Imam Malik's honoring of knowledge. He honored knowledge to the point that he was once asked, why did you not take knowledge from Amr ibn Dinar? Why didn't you go and take hadith from him? Hadith specifically, sorry, not knowledge. Why did you not take hadith from Amr bin Dinar? So Imam Malik said that I actually went. But when I got there, I saw that people were taking the hadith from him while standing up. And I found it very disrespectful to take the hadith of the Prophet wasallam standing up, so I wouldn't take any. This was his level of ta'zimul ilm, honoring the knowledge, honoring the Islamic sciences, the Islamic knowledge, particularly the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was once asked by his nephew about a mas'ala. 
So his nephew came along, you know, if your uncle's the mufti of Medina, it's pretty good. You can always ask all the questions that you want. So he goes and he asks him about a mas'ala. Imam Malik tells him, wait here. He goes, he makes wudu, and then after he makes wudu, he sits on his chair that he usually does, and then he says, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and then he begins. And his nephew is the one who actually narrates this. He said that he wouldn't even give fatwa until he get, does, uh, he would not give answers or give fatwa until he did this regularly. So every time someone would come to him, he would go and make wudu and um, sit in a presentable way and then say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and then he would begin. And again, it's a form of honoring the ilm. That you could, he could have answered the question while he didn't have wudu. But rather, he chose to be on wudu just because it was a sacred science. Just because he was narrating something from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or giving a ruling in the religion of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Um, and it's another famous uh, story is that Imam Malik was once asked 40 different masail. Right? So someone came, they've got 40 questions ready. And they start shooting at him. One, 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 one. Imam Malik answered five of them. And the rest of them he would not answer. And this is something that Imam Malik actually says later on, or later on in that book. He says, it is necessary for the scholar to give to his students, to teach his students, give them from his inheritance, the phrase, La Adri, I do not know. Because if you say la adri, of course it's protection for you. Especially when it is something in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't know the answer to. So Imam Malik, he's the Imam of Medina. He's the Mufti of Medina. He's the scholar whose name has gone across the lands. People would come from all over the Islamic lands to listen to him. Even the Khulafa. Some of the Khulafa, as they were passing by for Hajj and they'd visit Medina, they would make sure that they stopped by Imam Malik, to listen from him. And one such story is Harun al-Rashid. So Harun al-Rashid is one of the Abbasi Khulafa. Right? So after the, khulafa, the four Khulafa, you had the Umayyin, and after the Umayyin, you had the Abbasiyin. Right? So Harun al-Rashid is one of the Khulafa of the Abbasiyin. He passes by Medina, and he's got his sons with him. And he wants to see Imam Malik. He wants to see the scholar. So Imam Malik comes, they sit down, he tells him, Harun says to Imam Malik, read the Muwatta to me. Imam Malik says, I haven't read the Muwatta in a very, very long time. Many, many years. I don't read it anymore. The students read it to me. And then, you know, I explain and correct and so on. So I don't read the Muwatta anymore. And when you have a command coming from the Khalifa, right? At the time, the, the, literally the strongest man on the face of the planet. Um, it's very weighty. It carries a lot of weight. But Imam Malik was firm. I'm not going to read. So Harun al-Rashid said, okay, fine. Tell everyone to leave the majlis and then I'll read to you. And Imam Malik said, if the layman or if the general population is prevented from this knowledge, then the specific people for whom we are doing this majlis, i.e. such as yourself, they're not going to benefit from it either. So either everyone's here and we all benefit or no one's going to benefit. So Harun al-Rashid again backed down. But he didn't read it himself. <laughs> so he got a third person to read the Muwatta. But it goes again back to show you that Imam Malik, rahimahullah, was very set and firm on how he learned to honor the religion. Because this, this method is not something he invented. Rather, it was a method that he learned from the scholars and from the teachers before him. So he wasn't inventing a new method. Rather, he was just carrying on the tradition of the ulama, the scholars who had come before. And Imam Malik, <coughs> rahimahullah, when he would sit down for a majlis of ilm, he would go in, he would put on tib, tatayyab, so he would put on uh, perfume essentially. And then he would put kuhul in his eye. Again, another form of beautification. And then he would put on his best clothing. And then he would call for fans, right? Like, you know, hand fans. And the hand fans would be distributed to everyone, and then they would begin. And this was to show you that Imam Malik followed a similar principle to the idea that when it's Friday, what are you meant to do? Have ghusul, 
put your best clothing on, put some perfume on, cut your nails, and so on, right? Um, so Imam Malik followed a similar methodology out of uh, respect and honoring for the knowledge that he was about to teach. And his majlis, his sitting, it was always a majlis of patience and a majlis of tranquility and peace. And there wouldn't be any voice raising. No one would raise their voices. And there wouldn't be any wasteful speech. Rather, the speech was directed towards the ilm that they were there for. And of course, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, wasn't going to allow anything else anyway. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah, a physical, a physical description of him is that he was tall and he was a thick build. And he was also very white. And he had some redness in his face. He had some bold boldness, the front of his head. And then the parts of his head, uh, the parts of his hair that remained were white. And his beard was also white. And he wouldn't um, trim the, must the mustache too much, right? Rather, he thought that it was something inappropriate to trim it too much. Uh, but that was, that was his opinion, uh, rahimahullah. And Imam Malik would also put a amama on, so the turban. And specifically, the way he would put it is when he would put it on, he'd put a piece of it under his, um, under his chin, and then the loose end of it, he'd put it behind him, between his shoulders. So it was always trailing behind as opposed to carrying it on his shoulder, for example. Now, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, like many scholars before him and after him, went through a mihna. So when we say mihna in Arabic, it just means trial, right? Something that's very tough. And Imam Malik, like others, other scholars, went through his own. Now, before we begin into the mihna, I just want to give some context. At the time of the Khulafa, the Abbasiyin, when a new Khalifa was appointed, they would have to go get pledges of allegiance from people, right? And of course, you get the pledges of allegiance from the senior people, the leaders of their tribes and towns and so on. But what they would do is, they would get this person and they would say, look, you're going to give allegiance to this new Khalifa. And when you give allegiance, you're also going to make an oath by Allah that if you ever rebelled against the Khalifa, that your wives would be um, divorced from you and any slaves that you had would become free. Right? So he was essentially bound by his oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was a problem. Because if you ever thought of rebelling, then you're stuck. You can't rebel. Even if you see the need to do so, if it was justified, and I don't know what the rulings on this are, so don't ask me. But the point is, um, you were stuck. You couldn't do anything. So someone came and asked Imam Malik, if someone is forced into divorcing their wife, is this divorce applicable? Does it count? Is she actually divorced from him? Imam Malik said, no, this doesn't apply because you were forced. You were under compulsion. This news spread, and the governor of Medina heard about this. So he called Imam Malik. He said, look, this fatwa of yours doesn't really fit with us. Okay, of course, if you're in power, you don't want people to be rebelling against you. So figure out what you want to do, um, but it doesn't work. And he let him go. So Imam Malik went back, started teaching again. This governor sent someone to attend the majlis. And to ask the same question again. Just to see, did Imam Malik take the hint or not? So this person asked Imam Malik, if someone is uh, forced into divorcing their wife, does it apply? Imam Malik said, no, it does not apply. This man went back to the governor and told him. And so this governor ordered that Imam Malik be brought. And that his arms be tied and pulled. To the point where one of his shoulders actually became dislocated and permanently damaged where he couldn't even lift the cloak on his shoulder anymore. And then he was lashed on his back um, until basically cracks in his skin started to form. Cuts in his skin began, be began to form. And then just to add to the punishment, they put Imam Malik on a donkey. And they would uh, parade him around Medina. And then to increase again in the punishment, they would tell him, um, identify yourself publicly. So that everyone knows, this is the Imam Malik, this is what's happening to him. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he's sitting on the donkey. And he would say, those who know me, you know who I am. And if you don't, my, I am Malik bin Anas. And I say that it is that the divorce does not fall if you are compelled. 
So the governor heard this. He's like, get him off the donkey. <laughs> Put him aside. Right? This is not gonna, going to work. And subhanAllah, um, the commentary on this story is that those lashes, after those lashes, Imam Malik's prestige and status amongst the people only continued to rise and only continued to increase. When the Khalifa, um, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, yeah, um, came to Medina, he was going to Hajj, so he passed by Medina, and he heard of what this governor had done. So he went into Imam Malik and he apologized, and he, and he made oaths by Allah that I did not know about this, and I did not order for this, and I did not want this to happen. And see the person who punished you, I'm going to bring him, and I'm going to punish him multiple folds out of the, the disrespect that he caused for you. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah, after making dua for the Khalifa, he said, I have already forgiven him. And I forgave him for, your, for his closeness, for his relationship to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for his closeness to you. And of course, uh, the Khalifa was very happy with this and it was the end of that. But Imam Malik then was talking to his students about this incident. He tells them that while I was being lashed, I was scared that I was going to die and that I would meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and someone of his relatives would enter into hellfire because I did not forgive them. So he's already thinking ahead. Even though it's probably well within his rights that he didn't do anything wrong and he's being publicly humiliated and physically abused for this and pressured. But he's thinking ahead that the day of judgment is going to come. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admits me into Jannah, I'm going to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can I stand in front of him knowing that I caused one of his relatives to be in hellfire. And again, it shows you, Imam Malik, the type of person that he was. Not only was he very much educated in the Islamic sciences and very much highly ranked amongst all the scholars of his time and after and before and so on, but his heart was connected to the afterlife already. He was already thinking of the day he was going to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and two more, thing, two more notes on Imam Malik before we wrap up, insha'Allah. Remember we mentioned that Imam Malik compiled Al-Muwatta, Muwatta al-Imam Malik, his hadith book. The Khalifa, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, the same one that we just spoke about, he once met with Imam Malik and they had a discussion and they had a chat. And then he told him that I'm going to um, get your Muwatta and I'm going to get it transcribed. We're going to make multiple copies. And then I'm going to send it to all the Amsar of the, of the Islamic land. Masr basically means, not Egypt, Masr as in Egypt, but Masr as in a uh, land, right? So Masr can have the, the meaning of the name of the country, and Masr can just be a region. So Amsar is the plural of regions, and therefore he meant that he was going to send it to all the major cities and capital cities of the Islamic world. And then I'm going to force them to teach muwatta and to not teach anything else. But Imam Malik told him, out of his mercy and his foresight, he told him that people have already gotten accustomed to what they've learned. The, the hadith that have reached them, they've worked with that. And they've derived rulings from that. And this is what the layman has already learned. For you to change them all now is going to be very hard. So basically let them be. And this is a very important point in tolerance amongst the Muslims. That as Muslims, as soon as someone enters the fold of Islam, he has the rights of the Muslims upon me. Yes, we may disagree. Yes, we may have differences. Yes, you may even think you are correct and he is wrong. But that does not take away from his rights upon you or from his rights upon us. Right? So Imam Malik, he understands that even though he believes he is more correct in his fiqh opinions and his, rule, and his rulings based on the narrations that have reached him and him living in Medina and, 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 he still understands that we need to have some leniency. And so long as this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted in his religion, there's no need to create this tightness and constriction. And lastly, the last story about Imam Malik. So Imam Malik, as we mentioned, or we didn't mention it, but he lived in Medina, right? He was the scholar of Medina. He always lived there. And even when he was asked, come with us back to Baghdad by the Khalifa, Come live in Baghdad. And you know, if you're living with a Khalifa, you're living a very comfortable life. But Imam Malik said, no, the Medina is better and I'm going to stay here. So he stayed in Medina. 
Anyway, in every one of those cities, there were other scholars. In Misr, Egypt, there was the scholar al His name is al -Layth. Imam Malik and al are contemporaries. So they stand on equal levels, right? As in, they're all in the same category or the same um, rank, let's say. Okay, very liberally using the term, but the same level. So, Imam Malik has a, uh, a principle that he operates under. That if the people of Medina agree on something, Amal Ahl Medina, then we take that as evidence. Right? Because the people of Medina, they are the children and the grandchildren of the companions. So, if they, if they are doing something, then they learnt it from their fathers. And, they were sitting with, and their fathers were sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's not like they invented something. Right? So for Imam Malik, this was a principle that he would operate under. al Layth in Egypt disagreed with him. He didn't see that as uh, a strong enough point. <laughs> so Imam Malik, rahimahullah, wrote a letter to al Layth, And it was a very, very firm letter. In fact, the letter was so firm that rather than talking to al Layth as though they are equals... He spoke to him as though he is a student. Right? And al Layth, rahimahullah, also responded back to the letter um, of Imam Malik. And this was all done civilly, right? Like, there was no swearing. Of course, I would like, they're scholars. But the years go on, and Imam Malik, his daughter, is going to get married. So he wants to um, prepare something for her, get her ready for the marriage. And one of the things that he wanted was a particular type of perfume that was only available in Egypt, right? So who does he have in Egypt? Al-Layth, right? So he writes to Al-Layth, after, you know, Asana alaikum and so on, all that, that I need such and such to prepare my daughter. What do you expect Al-Layth would do? Rather than, rather than thinking to himself, the time has come for me to take my revenge. How dare you speak to me, speak down to me as your student and, and, and. No. Rather, Al-Imam Al-Layth, Rahimahullah, he prepared the whole camel's worth of that perfume. And he sent it for Imam Malik. And Imam Malik used what he needed for his daughter. And there was so much left over that Imam Malik was able to pay his debts with it. Right? So he sent him like tons, essentially. And the idea here is two, po two points. The first one we mentioned, that Al-Layth, Rahimahullah, he didn't, it didn't even cross his mind to, put, to belittle or to humiliate a scholar like himself. Right? Actually, forget scholar. It didn't cross his mind to belittle or humiliate another Muslim like himself. And Imam Malik, it didn't cross his mind that I did such and such to him back in the days and now he's going to take his revenge on me. It didn't even cross his mind. And the question is, Why? And the answer is very simple, because they're Muslim, right? As Muslims, the differences and the disagreements and even the fights and the arguments, they will, always, uh, they will always persist. It's not something that's ever going to go away. It's something that was present at the time of the Prophet wasallam with the companions, and it is present till today. The difference was how you dealt with it, right? Think of it as boxes. My argument with you or my disagreement with you is about a fiqhi matter. Why should it spill into everything else? Why should it spill into my students? And why should it spill into my family and into the population? And why should we have fights about what for? Rather, you and I are Muslim. And you and I are brothers before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, with a bond that is stronger than that of blood. So why should we ever put that between us? And this is... Again, from the short stories of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, just to show the type of person that he was. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, his, uh, his knowledge became so widespread that, like we mentioned, it was the dominant madhab in Al-Andalus, Spain, Muslim Spain. And the dominant madhab till today in Morocco and Algeria and uh, Tunis and those areas. And even parts of Egypt were also... Um, following the Maliki Madhab. And from Imam Malik also came many students, of whom the, one of the most notable is Al-Imam Shafi'i. 
So imagine that. Imagine leaving behind, not only leaving a treasure trove worth of Islamic knowledge to teach, but leaving another scholar behind who then creates his own treasure trove. And so every reward that Imam Shafi'i gets, rahimahullah, that Imam Malik contributed to, Imam Malik is still getting rewards for. He's been dead for hundreds, thousands of years, <laughs> over a thousand years. And he's still reaping the rewards till today. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on the amount of people that came from them, subhanAllah. So this was a short uh, snippet of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, one of our pious predecessors, one of the scholars of Islam, whose knowledge spread and influenced many, 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 many people and continues to do so today by the blessing and um, by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته